Well, good evening and welcome to Power for Today Prophetic Ministries as we get into our Tuesday night Bible study. I want to welcome everybody and uh, uh, we're going to be continuing. Uh, we've been looking at this, uh, this whole idea that uh, we, we see in the scriptures that Jesus talked about. The, the difference between being uh, a Pharisee and being a Christian, the difference between uh, having a form of godliness and, and uh, having the power of God, being religious versus being spiritual. And uh, because we're seeing a lot of this in the church today. And uh, we need to understand this and uh, make sure that we're on the, the right side. Amen. So let's uh, take a moment and pray before we get into the word. And uh, uh, we just want to thank God tonight for the Holy Spirit who is our teacher. He is the spirit of truth who searches all things and knows all things and is able to teach us all things. And uh, we need that knowledge. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you tonight as we look into the word of God. That, Lord, you will reveal the truth to us. Help us to rightly divide the word. Lead us and guide us into all the truth and anoint the word to work in all of its effectual power in us to produce the kingdom of God in each one of our lives as you grow us up spiritually into our head, Jesus Christ. Lord, we want to commit this time into your hands that you'll be glorified and everything said and done. That, Lord, you just open the word to our understanding. Help us to see more clearly and to understand more fully and to receive the word of God by faith, uh, whereby it will produce your kingdom in each of our lives. We thank you, O God, for the truth that sets us free. We thank you, O God, for your word that... Uh, directs us in the way you'd have us to go and to become the people that you've called us to be. And we give you all the praise, the glory, the honor. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise God. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm uh, glad that uh, uh, Patuxi uh, Phil said that uh, spring's coming early. Amen. So I'm, uh, uh, I'm, I'm looking to him to, to, stick to, to stick to his prediction. And uh, we can use some early spring. We've had a little bit of snow here in, uh, uh, this past week. And uh, fortunately, it's uh, uh, warmed up enough to, this last couple of days to melt it all. But, but I'm ready for some spring. Amen. Anyway, let's get back into the Word of God. Uh, as we've been looking at the last couple of weeks, uh, uh, there's a difference between being religious and being spiritual. Jesus calls religion, uh, when, he, when he speaks to the Pharisees and the, and the, 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 the Sadducees, uh, he speaks to them as religious people because they lacked the true character uh, to be spiritual. And uh, Jesus talked about how they have an outward form uh, of righteousness. They look good to men outwardly. They appear to be righteous to men, but the reality is when Jesus looks at them, when he sees their hearts, he sees that they're full of uncleanness, hypocrisy, and uh, uh, they, they of lawlessness. And so uh, Jesus tells us if our righteousness does not exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, we will not get into the kingdom of God. And as we looked at with Paul, Paul tells us that the problem is that uh, there are many in the church uh, that have a form of godliness, but they deny the power of God to actually make them uh, godly. And, and, and that's the, uh, uh, the root of the problem. Uh, there's many people in the church today that either don't understand uh, what Jesus did, or they deny the power of God to actually do a work, effectual work, that's going to make them godly, righteous, holy, in a real and practical way. And so, uh, as we've been looking through this, uh, we can see that Paul addresses this issue, Jesus addresses this issue, and uh, again, the, the, it all comes down to that one thing, having a form of godliness, but denying the power. And uh, because of that, uh, the Bible tells us in Jude, he says, because these people have a form without the reality, it, it, what it comes down to is they're still being led or walking in the flesh. 
And Jude tells us that because of that, being led by the lust of the flesh, by, rather by the Spirit of God, that they are sensual persons not having the Spirit of God. And again, it goes right along with what Jesus was saying. If your righteousness doesn't exceed their righteousness, uh, you're not going to get into the kingdom of God. Why? Because it takes a real righteousness. And it takes uh, having the Holy Spirit to get you into the kingdom of God. So as we look through this, Paul and, and other scriptures tell us that the, the key is embracing the work of God in order to deliver us from the form and bring us into the substance of who is Christ. And Peter told us that uh, uh, the way that takes place is God's divine power gives us everything we need for uh, things that pertain to life and godliness. And that power is released through faith in the knowledge of Christ. And through our faith, and when God releases that power in our lives, he tells us we become the partakers of divine nature, uh, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So there, there's, a, there's a, an exchange that takes place. We put off the old man, we put on the new man. And uh, we put off the old nature and we put on the new nature. And the new nature is a nature that is created in righteousness and holiness after the image of God. And so as we look through these, uh, Paul uh, tells us the result of putting on that new nature and putting off the old nature, uh, which is done by the power of God, the result is that it changes our uh, 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 character. It changes uh, our conduct. It affects the way we do things because a nature is what determines uh, what you do. So last week we, we looked at... Uh, uh, a couple of those scriptures, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 11, where Paul says, uh, but you once were, we once were, meaning we're no more. If you once were, it means you're not that thing anymore. So Paul tells us why, what, what made the difference, what changed us. He says, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. In other words, Salvation, this, this transforming work of God, is dependent upon God's power actually doing something to you that's going to change your very nature and character to whereby you are no longer uh, an alcoholic. You're no longer an adulterer. You're no longer a murderer. Okay, You were, but no more. Why? Because you've been washed. You've been sanctified. You've been justified by the power of God to make you into a new creation and thereby... Your, your character, your conduct changes because of that. And that's the evidence that God's power has done something in your life. It results in a change of your conduct, the way you act, the things you do. And uh, uh, Paul tells us that when we put off the old man with his deeds, again, talking about it changes your character. When you put off the old man, it's the removal of the deeds, those works that that old man does, which are sin, lust of the flesh, uh, and all that. You put that off, and so the character that, that is changed uh, when you put off that old man and when you put on the new man who is created in the image of God. And uh, Jesus talked about in Matthew 7, you'll know them by their fruits, and explained to us last week how uh, the nature uh, determines what you do. Okay, Jesus tells a good, free, good tree bears good fruit. A bad tree bears bad fruit. And then Jesus tells us, explains to us how he's talking about us and uh, how uh, uh, out of the, a good man, a good man being a good tree, uh, out of the good treasure of his heart, talking about your nature, brings forth good things. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, brings forth evil things. In other words, your nature determines what comes out of you. Okay, what kind of nature you have will determine the kind of fruit uh, that comes forth from your life. So if you're, that's why Jesus says you'll know them by their fruits. If the fruit is bad, if you look at somebody and their, and their fruit, their, the things they do, the way they act, uh, uh, comes forth, and it's sinful. It's, it's, it's rooted in the lust of the flesh. It's rooted in carnality. It's rooted, rooted in selfishness. That tells us there's a problem with the heart. 
There's, it's a heart problem. There's a, the, the nature's bad. The, uh, the source is bad. Okay? But when your fruit is righteous, when the things you are do, that you do are in righteousness and holiness, uh, they're, they're not sinful. That tells us that uh, your fruit is good, therefore your heart must be good. Out of the good treasure of your heart, you're bringing forth uh, good uh, fruit. So, the thing we have to understand is the act of God to make us into a new creation requires the work of the Holy Spirit. This is the difference right here. This is the crux, and, and, and really this is the stumbling stone uh, in the church today uh, that uh, people, people are, 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 are stumbling upon. They're, they're missing the truth here. They're not getting the very crux of the gospel. Uh, when, when God saves a person, it's not you just saying a prayer, then God declaring you uh, uh, saved, born again, uh, uh, declaring you to be holy, declaring you to be right. God doesn't declare you to be something that you're not. Okay, that would make God a liar. God doesn't do that. He does not declare you to be something that you're not. Okay, what God does is, he, the, when he saves a person, he releases his power to actually make you into that new creation so that you are what God declares you to be. You are righteous. You are holy in a real and powerful way. Why? Because it takes God's power to do it. It, 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 and, and that's the difference, again, between a person that is, that is uh, 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 a natural versus spiritual or religious versus spiritual or a Pharisee versus a Christian, a true Christian, okay? The difference there is, uh, did you just uh, receive a declaration from God or did God's power come upon you and actually change your nature, your character from within to make you into this new creation? And that's why when Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, uh, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, but are not going to get into the kingdom of God. Why? He says, because I don't know you because you're still lawless. You can be doing good works. You can be doing uh, 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 religious works. Uh, but that's not what's going to get you into heaven. Works don't get you into heaven. What gets you into heaven is holiness. Without holiness, nobody shall see God. And it takes God's power to actually make you holy. And that's what, me, what it means to be born again. Okay? You're born into this newness of life. Okay? As I said before, that, that there's nothing more than, uh, 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 than having a form of godliness but denying the power, okay? And that's what people do. When you reject the truth, you believe a lie. But basically what you're saying when you, say, when you deny the power of God, as Peter said, his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness to actually make us godly. When you deny that power, when you reject the truth, you're going to believe a lie. And the lie is that, Romans chapter 1, Paul tells us, the lie is that instead of worshiping God wholeheartedly and being sold out, surrendered to God in, your, in, 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 in all of your being, you love God with all your heart, soul, and strength, you love your neighbors yourself because you've been made into this new creation and, and God's given you a new heart that is filled with the love of Christ. Instead of that, what happens is when you only have a form of godliness, that means your heart is still corrupted by sin. So rather than worshiping God as creator, you worship self. You, you, you're, you're still caught up in that pride of self, and that lust of flesh. And, and that's what separates the religious from the spiritual, the Pharisee, from the Christian. And that's what Jesus was trying to explain in the Sermon on the Mount that uh, uh, and, and in... in um, uh, in uh, Matthew chapter 23, when he, when he was talking about the Pharisees and the scribes, that's what he was talking about. They look good outside. They know how to say the right thing. They know how to dress the dress. You know, they know how to tell others uh, what, what to do. But the reality was they were full of uncleanness and, and hypocrisy and uh, uh, lawlessness. And Jesus said, you got to clean the inside of the cup and the outside will be clean as well. It's the inside that God be taken care of. Why? Because it's the inside, it's the heart, it's the nature uh, that is the source of sin. Uh, Jesus tells us out of the heart comes sin. So if you don't cleanse the inside of the cup, 
then the outside is not going to be clean either. And again, you're going to have the racists of the scribes and Pharisees, which is a form without the reality. And as Jesus said, you'll not get into the kingdom of God. Now, we have to understand something. Justification, okay? Justification is what, is what saves us. Justification is, is God's act uh, to make us just, to make us righteous, okay? Justification is an act whereby God, uh, 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 we, whereby we are declared to be righteous through our faith in Jesus Christ, okay? On the one hand, it is the removal of sin and guilt and condemnation, okay? So when, when God justifies us, we are delivered from uh, 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 a sin, we're forgiven, and uh, we are uh, delivered from guilt and condemnation, from the wrath of God, okay? On the other hand, it is also the receiving of the righteousness of Christ, okay? Now, many in the, in the church today have this idea. They, they, they look at justification simply as God declaring us to be something other than what we really are. And this is, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is where that separation takes place, okay? Because it doesn't take any power for God to declare something if it's not going to affect anything, if it's not going to change anything. In, in other words, if, if God says you are righteous, but the reality is, like Jesus said, and the scribes and Pharisees, you're still full of sin and hypocrisy and lawlessness, then what does that tell us? Well, there was no power involved. There was just a declaration that did not actually produce anything in you, okay? And, and that's where a lot of people in the church today stand. That's, that's what they believe, okay? And, and, and uh, they get this idea from the justification of Abraham. So if we go back, if you, you go back in, in the Old Testament and see when God uh, met Abraham, and Paul quotes this in Romans chapter 4, verse 3, okay, look what, look what he says. What does the Scripture say? This is Paul quoting uh, from the Old Testament about uh, Abraham, uh, God bringing Abraham to himself. Now look what Paul says. What does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So when Abraham believed God, the, the Bible tells us God accounted it to him for righteousness. He accounted his faith in God for righteousness, okay? So for Abraham and all of the people of the, in the Old Testament, all the Israelites, all the people that came to God in the Old Testament, God declared them to be righteous by faith even though now listen, even though they were not actually righteous, okay? They were not actually righteous. They still had sin within him, okay? The inside, the cup, the, the inside was not cleansed yet, okay? They were all sinful within, within their hearts, which is why uh, they had to maintain these uh, sacrificial rituals of shedding blood year after year. Why? Because they were never uh, really clean from sin, okay? They were just uh, declared righteous by their faith in God. But that declaration did not change them, didn't change their heart, didn't change their nature, okay? It, it was just a declaration of God uh, with no physical effect, okay? So every year they had to, uh, in, in fact, not just every year, year but uh, they were continually having sacrifices. But once a year, the Day of Atonement, they had to come. All the Jews uh, had to come to Jerusalem and uh, on the Day of Atonement and uh, confess their sins, and, and all this blood had to be shed year after year after year, okay? So in, in Romans, Paul uses Abraham to show us the, the only acceptable way to approach God is through faith, okay? It's through faith. Nothing else is acceptable to God. That, that's why he tells us it's impossible to please God. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. That's the only way to approach God is through faith, that we believe him for who he is and, and, and what he does, okay? Nothing else is acceptable. Being good, offering sacrifices, uh, keeping spiritual rituals, obeying commandments, doing good works, uh, uh, will not get you to God. You, you, that won't save you. That, that won't get you 
uh, into God's grace. Only faith will get you into God's grace. That's why Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith. By grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. In other words, we cannot take any credit for our salvation. It's only through faith in God uh, and God's grace, God's unmerited favor that allows us to approach him by faith to receive this salvation, okay? So we have to understand that, okay? So don't, don't, don't put words in my mouth. Don't try to say I, didn't, I said something I didn't say. I am never saying that uh, we are sur- saved by works. We are always saved by grace through faith, okay? But we have to understand uh, what that means and what that should produce, uh, so that we're not uh, uh, we're 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 not uh, religious, but spiritual. We're not Pharisees. We are true born again Christians. I'm going to show you this just a minute now. Follow with me. The the truth given here is that we are justified by faith. Okay, but but what me what me us under what we have to understand here is that as far as the justification of Abraham. And all of those in the Old Testament. This declaration of righteousness was not a saving righteousness. You have to understand this because, again, there's too many in the church today that are looking to the 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 uh, righteousness of Abraham, thinking that's all they need, thinking that all they have to have is is say a prayer and and then believe that God declared them righteous. With, but, but we have to understand, that righteousness didn't save Abraham. It didn't save the Israelites. It didn't save anybody before the cross of Jesus Christ. Okay? It, it, it is not the same as the justification through faith in Jesus Christ under the new covenant. There's a difference between the faith of Abraham and the faith uh, in Jesus Christ under the new covenant. Okay? In Hebrews uh, chapter 11 and verse 13, look what he says. And, and remember, chapter thirteen, uh, chapter eleven of Hebrews is the faith chapter. It's where where God lists all these mighty men and women of faith. I mean, Moses and Joshua and David, and you know the whole list. He gives us all these great men and women of faith, Abraham, and uh, uh, how God was was pleased with them. But but listen to what the Bible says. Okay, listen to the Word of God talking about the faith uh, 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 of, of Abraham. Look what it says. These all died in faith. Okay? They, they lived a life of faith, and they died in faith. But look what he says. Not having received the promises. Not having received the promises. Okay? They had the righteousness of faith. Just like Abraham, all of them, Abraham and all those Israel, they believed God, and it was accounted to them for righteousness. But guess what? Not having received the promises but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. In other words, they could see it in the future, but they couldn't have the promises for themselves at that time. Okay? In Hebrews chapter 11, 39, and verse 40, he tells exactly why. Why the faith of Abraham, why the righteous of Abraham could not get them into heaven, could not save them. Look what he says. And all these, all these mighty men and women of God of faith, all of them, David, Abraham, Moses, you name them, all these mighty men, men and women of God of faith, they lived a life of faith, having obtained a good testimony through faith, God was pleased with them. They received a good testimony from God by their faith, did not receive the promise. What was the promise? The promise was the giving of the Holy Spirit to impart eternal life. None of those before the cross of Christ could obtain the promise. They could not receive the Holy Spirit. Therefore, they could not obtain eternal life. This is the Word of God. We've got to get a hold of it. We need a revelation of these things. Okay, So he says... Even though they lived a life of faith, they did not receive the promise, God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. 
that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Why couldn't they receive the promise of the Holy Spirit and eternal life? Because they had, didn't have any means to make them perfect. That word perfect actually means complete. They were missing the vital link to provide a justification that would produce a real and practical righteousness which would result in receiving the promise of God of the indwelling Holy Spirit bringing them eternal life. That's what he's talking about. The word perfect means complete. They could not be made complete. Why? They didn't have the means to make them complete. Okay? Although all of these great men and women of God had a good testimony of faith before God, they were not complete. They did not receive the finished work of, the, of, of, of God's saving grace. Okay? They lacked a crucial element necessary for salvation, which was the cleansing of sin from the heart to make them holy. They could not be made holy. They could not, they did not have any means to affect the inward man. That's why they had to go through those sacrifices year after year. That's why I had to shed blood and blood upon blood upon blood. And the sacrifices never, never stopped. I mean, a continual sacrifice. Every year they were reminded of their sin. Why? Because they had no means to cleanse the inside of the cup, to get to the root source of the sin within them that came through Adam's fall. That was the problem. And so they were left in a condition of incompleteness concerning the saving work of God. So look what he tells in Hebrews chapter 10. I'm going to read from verse 1 through 16. Listen to what the Bible tells us. Furthermore, every human priest stands at his altar of service, ministering daily, every day. The priest every day would go into the temple. Every day the priest would minister, offering the same sacrifices over and over again, killing bulls and, and sheep and goats and, and birds. I, I mean, every day they would go in and minister to the altar every day, daily, offering up sacrifices over and over and over and look what he says, which never are able to strip from every side of us the sins that envelop us and take them away. All those sacrifices, all that blood was shed, all those animals that were killed could never take away our sin. It couldn't do it. It couldn't remove it. The blood of animals had no power to remove sin. It was merely a temporary covering, a temporary covering until God brought what was necessary to complete his saving work. So look what he says. Whereas, okay, so these priests were offering daily sacrifice, killing blood after killing animal after animal, shedding blood after blood, and it could never take sins away. Then he goes on to say, whereas this one, Christ, okay, Th those animals could not take away sin. Those priests could do nothing that would take away the people's sin. Whereas this one, Jesus Christ, after he had offered a single sacrifice for our sins that shall avail for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. What's he saying? All those millions and millions and millions of animals that were killed to shed their blood could never take away one single ounce of sin from us. But Jesus Christ, we, we really need a revelation. I'm tell, we need a revelation of this in the church. Like we, I'm telling you, this, if you get a revelation of what he's talking about, it will set you free. It will set you free. All that blood could never take away sins, but this, this, this man, Jesus Christ, one offering one single sacrifice, one single sacrifice was enough for all sin, for all time. And with just that one sacrifice, he sat down at the right hand of God. In other words, what, is, what this is telling us is the one sacrifice of Christ did what all the blood of those animals could never do. It took away all sin. 
and he sat down at the right hand of God. Why? Because he never needed to make another sacrifice again. Why? Because his sacrifice was sufficient to do exactly what needed to be done to make us complete, to make us perfect, to make us holy for all time. Okay? So look what he says. Look what he goes on. Then to wait until his enemy should be made a footstool uh, beneath his feet. Okay? Jesus sat down. Okay? His work was finished. He sat down at the right hand of the Father to wait until his enemies should be made a footstool under his feet. In other words, to wait as the Holy Spirit would take the, the blood of Christ that was shed for our sacrifice and apply it to the hearts of men and women everywhere. To, 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 to deliver them from sin and his power, to deliver them from the power of Satan and make them into a new creation, completely born again, completely saved through this work of Christ. Now look what he says. For by, verse 14, Hebrews 10, 14, for by a single offering, by a single offering, he has forever completely cleansed and perfected those who are consecrated and made holy. What was the problem with Abraham's justification? Why couldn't, it, why couldn't they receive the promises? Because it could not make them perfect. It couldn't complete the work of God. But Jesus, with one sacrifice, Jesus Christ, with his one sacrifice, with his blood, has forever completely cleansed and perfected, made complete those who are consecrated and made holy through the work of Christ. He says, and also the Holy Spirit adds his testimony to us in confirmation of this. And then he quotes from Jeremiah to explain exactly what happened when Jesus, in other words, he's telling us, this is what Jeremiah was prophesying about the new covenant that was going to come to do what the law could not do, to do what the blood of bulls and goats could not do. Jesus was going to come to do what that could not do, to take away our sin. So, so he tells us, the Holy Spirit adds his testimony saying this, this is the agreement, this is the covenant that I will set up and conclude with them after those days, says the Lord. I will imprint my law upon their hearts and I will inscribe them on their minds, on their inmost thoughts and understanding. In other words, he's saying, through this redemptive work of Christ, he's going to remove the sin nature, and he's going to give us a new heart, a new spirit, and he's going to put his law within us. He's going to write it inside of us. Why? So that we, instead of being ruled by rules and regulations, we will be led by the Spirit of God. We will have a new nature, the law within us, that by nature we do what the law calls us to do. Okay? Under the new covenant of Jesus Christ, okay, under the new covenant of Jesus Christ, we are still justified by faith. But the difference is that our justification is rooted in the blood of Jesus Christ, which is able to make us perfect or complete. In other words, it's a different justification than Abraham had because Abraham's justification could not make him complete and therefore could not receive the promise of the Holy Spirit of eternal life. But the justification of Jesus Christ through our faith in Christ makes us complete, and thereby we receive the impartation of the Holy Spirit to come dwell within us and to give us eternal life. So in Acts chapter 13, verse 38 and 39, look what he says. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man, through Jesus Christ, is preached to you the remission of sins, removal, deliverance from sins. And by him, everyone who believes is justified from all things which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Did, did, you, did you hear what he just said? Jesus came with a new gospel, with a new covenant. Jesus came with a better covenant that's got better promises. Jesus came to do what? To bring remission of sins. So that by him, by Jesus Christ, everyone who believes, 
Everyone who puts their faith believes in Jesus, who he is and what he did. If you believe, okay, you are justified from everything that you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Why? Because the law could not make them righteous. The law could not remove the sin from their hearts. Unlike Abraham, our justification is through the redemption of Jesus Christ. This means the full work of Christ, whereby we are made into a new creation with a new nature, free from sin, through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Amen? The washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. That's why in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, look what Paul says. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, how do you get in Christ? You got to, through faith, by grace, through faith, you have to be born again. You have to be justified through your faith in Christ, okay? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is, he is a new creation. He is a new creation. God does not call you something you're not. Now, look what Paul, look what Paul says. What does it mean to be a new creation? Old things have passed away. Remember what Paul said. You put off the old man. You put off the nature of sin. You remove the sin. You put off the old man. Old things are passed away. The old man is passed away. Adam is passed away. Okay? And behold, all things have become new. Everything comes new. The old is gone. The new has come. That's what he's talking about. So Romans chapter 5 and, and verse 9, Paul says this, Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. How are we justified? By the blood of Jesus Christ. We are justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. Moses was justified by faith in God. We are justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. There's a big difference because it's the blood of Jesus Christ that washes us, that makes us clean, that cleans the inside of the cup, that gives us a new nature, a new heart, that, that, that cuts off, that circumcises that old nature of sin. So even though Abraham was justified by faith, he died in faith. But he didn't receive the promise of God's redemptive work through Jesus Christ. It could only come, as he told us in, 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 in Hebrews, uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, it could only come, okay? Uh, 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 re, 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 remember what he said in, in uh, Hebrews 11. Uh, could not be perfect, made perfect apart from us. In other words, he was talking about, the writer was talking about the day that, that he was living in, that Christ had come. The, the, the real justification couldn't come until Christ had finished his work upon the cross. And so they couldn't receive the promise. So that's why, instead of them going directly to heaven uh, when they died, in faith, in God's favor, okay, they couldn't go straight to heaven. They, they couldn't go. Why? Because flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom of God. Sin cannot get in to the kingdom of God. Okay? So what had happened? They went into Hades. They went into Abraham's bosom in order to await the finished work of Christ on the cross. And after Jesus died upon the cross, where did he go? He went into Hades and he preached the gospel. He proclaimed his victory. He proclaimed his work upon the cross. It is finished to Abraham and to all the saints as well as to Satan and his minions and, and all the, the, those rebels that were on the other side of Hades. Jesus proclaimed his victory, and he preached the gospel to Abraham and David and Moses and Joshua and all those mighty men and women of God that were faithful and lived the life of faith before God that were in Abraham's bosom. Jesus went into Hades, and he preached the gospel to the Old Testament saints. And then, having received the promise, having been made perfect and complete, they were taken captive. They were taken up with Christ to now go and be with God in heaven. Only after Jesus finished his work upon the cross 
the completion of God's redemptive work required the blood of Jesus Christ because the blood of animals could not take away sin. The blood of Christ washes us from all sin, resulting in a change of our being in a real and practical way. Through the blood of Christ, we are delivered from sin and its power. We are delivered from Satan and his power. We are delivered from the law and his power. We become partakers of the divine nature of God, a nature of righteous, a nature of holiness. And we are made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We are made the righteousness of God. It's not a declaration. It's a reality. Why? Because it's done by the power of the Holy Spirit, taking that blood and applying it to our bodies, souls, and spirits, and washing us, the washing of regeneration to make us alive again, free from sin, and the renewing of the Holy Spirit to make us alive in Christ, hallelujah, free from the shackles of sin and death. <laughs> Praise God. Romans 5, 19, For if by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Not just said to be righteous. You are made righteous through the blood of Jesus Christ. Why? Because he removes the sin. He gives you a new heart. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We become God's righteousness. Why? Because we are partakers. We receive the very nature of God himself. We are restored to what God originally created Adam and Eve to be. Pure. Pure-hearted. Innocent. Free from sin. He restores us back to his original purpose in the image of God, the image of righteousness and holiness. In Romans 6, 4, Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. He's not talking about water. He's talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We, are bap we were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Look at what he said. Listen to what he said. Just as Christ was raised, just as Christ, the same way that Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, in the same way, how was he raised up? In a real and practical way, he was raised up. God's power, the power of the Spirit of holiness, raised Christ from the dead. And now he's telling us, in the same way, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. What's Paul saying? That this work of Christ, this work of redemption through faith in Jesus Christ and the blood of a lamb and the power of the Holy Spirit, it actually changes us into a new creation whereby the old man and his deeds the old man and his works are removed so that now we come forth. We are raised up from the dead. We are raised up by the power of the Holy Spirit to walk, to live a brand new life we've never lived before, free from sin. We live, we walk a life of righteousness because of the work that Jesus did. Everything to do with our justification and salvation was accomplished on the cross of Calvary by, we're, we, by means we were set free indeed by the Son of God. We are free indeed from sin, free indeed from the power of sin, free indeed from sin itself, resulting in our deliverance from sin, our being given a brand new heart, a brand new mind, a brand new spirit through faith in Jesus Christ. It's not based on a mere declaration of God, but rather on the actual working of God through His Holy Spirit, washing us, sanctifying us, justifying us by His mighty power and the blood of Jesus Christ. So we once were, but no more. Once were, no more. We're not a sinner. We're not an adulterer. We're not a murderer. We're not a liar anymore. Why? We've been washed. We've been sanctified. We've been justified in the name of Jesus, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, according to St. Vincent's, uh, uh, to Vincent's word studies, 
on justification of Romans chapter 3. Listen to what he says. Justification is not a mere legal transaction between God and man, though God is the absolute standard by which the new condition is evaluated, whether we regard God's view of the justified man or the man's moral condition when justified. The element of character must not only be eliminated from it, it must be foremost in it. Okay? In other words, what he is saying is, that this justification that Paul talks about is different from the justification of the Old Testament because it requires the element of a changed character, okay? Justification is more than pardon. Pardon is an act which frees the offender from the penalty of the law, okay? It adjusts the outward relation to the law, but does not necessarily affect any change in him personally. In other words, a pardon forgives us, but it doesn't change us. It doesn't do anything to the inner man. It doesn't deal with the heart of the, of the, heart of the problem, okay? It is necessary to, to justification, but it is not identical to it. Justification aims directly at character, and the idea of justification is that of making the man himself right or righteous. That the new and right relationship to God in which faith places him is based on a personal righteousness. As we just read a minute ago, that, that, that we walk in newness of life. That we become the righteous of God in him. That we are made righteous. That's what he's talking about. That's what Paul is trying to show us. The difference between the righteousness of Christ and based on his blood and the righteousness of Abraham based on the Old Testament faith. The act of faith begins a righteous life and a righteous character. The man is not made inherit, inherently holy in himself because his righteousness is derived from God. It is God's impartation. Again, we partake of God's nature. We take his nature upon us. Neither is he merely declared righteous by a legal fiction without reference to his personal character. In other words, God's not lying when he declares us to be righteous. It's not just some fiction to say we're righteous and reality we're not. That's what he's saying, okay? But the, but the justifying decree, the declaration of God which pronounces him righteous, is literally true to the fact in that he is a real sympathetic relation with the eternal source and norm of holiness and with the divine personal inspiration of character. The purpose of justification is to join us to God in a real and personal relationship. It unites man to the holy God. And through this union, he becomes that partaker of the divine nature and escapes the corruption that is in the world through lust. Why? Because God cannot be joined to a nature of lust. God cannot come into union with the world. Okay, what? <laughs> read Second Corinthians uh, uh, chapter chapter six. Okay, go go read that and, and see what he tells us. Okay, the intent of justification is expressly declared by Paul to be conformity to Christ's image. Okay, Romans chapter eight, verse twenty nine and thirty. Justification, which does not actually remove the wrong condition in man which is at the root of his enmity to God, is not New Testament, New Covenant justification. Without an actual change of the condition, a declaration that man is right is not true. It's a lie. The declaration of righteousness must be based on the man's actual moral condition. Hence, justification is called justification of life. Romans chapter 5. Verse 18, it is linked with the saving operation of the life of the risen Christ. Those who are in Christ Jesus walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. They exhibit patience, approval, hope, love. Why? Because that's their new nature. It's a nature that is filled with the fruits of the Holy Spirit. 
Justification means the presentation of the, sense, the self to God as a living sacrifice. Non-conformity to the world. Spiritual renewal. Right self-estimate. All that range of right practice and feeling which is portrayed in the 12th chapter of Romans. Okay? That's what justification in the New Testament means. All of this is borne out by the scriptures, which reveal result of God's power in actual change of heart and works. In other words, the evidence that what Paul declares to be justification in the New Testament, a justification, the blood of Jesus Christ, that result in a new moral character, a new moral being, an actual new creation that walks in newness of life, whose conduct is changed because the source, the heart, is changed, okay? It's borne out. The evidence is given by the fruit. That's what Jesus says. You'll know them by, your, by their fruits. You'll know them by their fruits. The evidence is the fruits of those that have been truly born again. Let me just give you one example because I see I'm out of time, and I'll finish this up next week, next Tuesday, 7 o'clock, but listen, let me just give you one scripture of an example that gives evidence of what Paul is talking about. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. Listen uh, to what he, this prophecy that was given, okay? And this prophecy was given in light of the new covenant of what God was going to do to change the condition of the Israelites from within so that they could obey the laws of God and they could enter into a true union with God, okay? Listen to what he says, Deuteronomy 36. And the Lord your God, Will what? Circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants. Okay? The Lord your God is going to circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants. And what's going to happen when he does it? What's going to happen when he does it? To love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. The result of the circumcision of God, the circumcision of the heart, is that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. Now, you tell me, you tell me, how is that possible? Because remember, that old man is rooted in self-love, pride, the desire to, to worship and serve self, okay? That's the old man. That's the nature of all of us. We are born with that nature of Adam. All of us, before our new birth, we have a self-love. We don't love God. That's why the Bible tells us nobody seeks God. Every one of us are separate, but every one of us are sinners. We do not seek God. Why? It's not in us to do that. But he's telling us here that when God circumcises your heart, you will be able to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Why? Because something had to happen. So when God declares that he circumcised your heart, it means he actually came in the power of the Holy Spirit and actually cut out the heart of sin and gave you a new heart so you can really love God with all your heart, soul, and strength and love your neighbor like yourself. You can fulfill the commandments of Jesus Christ. The circumcision of God results in a change of heart. And the result, the evidence that the work has been done, the evidence, the fruit that this work has been done by God's power, not just some declaration and we're still the same. No, a change of character, a change of nature, a change of action, a change of condition. Okay, The evidence is our ability to love God with all our heart and soul. Remember, remember what that means. To love God is to obey his commandments, which are both impossible, impossible without an actual change of heart through the power of God. You cannot obey the commandments. You cannot love God with all your heart's own strength without a change of character of nature. It's, it's the only way. So the point is, that everything we just told you about justification being a real and actual righteousness, that we are made the righteous of God, that, that, that we become the righteous of God in Christ Jesus, that this an actual change takes place. Okay, The evidence is that we walk in newness of life, that this work that he does results in a change of actions. Why? 
because a tree is known by its fruit, and a good tree bears good fruit. So if you make a bad tree a good fruit, a good tree, it's going to bear good fruit, and it won't bear bad fruit anymore. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is what separates the religious from the spiritual. It separates the Pharisee from the true Christian. It's what the, it separates these two, the form from the reality, from the substance. Okay. It, 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 this, this is it right here. It's the power of God that actually makes you into this new creation so we can do the things that God has called us to do. And next week, join with me next week, 7 o'clock on Tuesday. I'm going to show you numbers of scriptures that show us that everything Jesus does through this redemptive work always results in a change of conduct, a change of character, a change in the way you live. And if there's no fruit, if there's no evidence, guess what? We need to get in the Word of God, get on our faces and cry out to God, go back to the cross, and we need to get a hold of the truth that's going to set you free. Because if there's no evidence, that means God's power didn't do anything. And if God's power didn't do anything, then you're still a Pharisee. You're still just a religious person without the Holy Spirit. And that's a dangerous place to be because like Jesus said in that day, many will say, Lord, Lord, in that day. And they're not getting in the kingdom of God. Why? Because they haven't cleaned the inside of the cup. They, they, haven't, they haven't received the truth that sets them free. They haven't embraced the blood of Jesus Christ that washes them so that they can declare, I once was, but no more. I've been washed. I, I've been sanctified. I've been justified, not just in the name of Jesus Christ, but by the Spirit of God. God's power came down. God's power entered inside of me. God's power came by way of the Holy Spirit, and He, and he cleansed me. He sanctified me. He circumcised me. He crucified me. He made me into a new creation. That's the difference. That's the difference. And if your righteousness doesn't exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you can't get into the kingdom of God. That's the truth. That's the bottom line. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray that you would open the eyes of every single person. God, that you would break through the darkness of understanding, break through the blindness, especially, oh God, those that have denied the truth and believed the lie, especially those, oh God, that have, been, that have gotten a form of godliness but denied the power of Jesus Christ to set them free. They, they don't believe in the power of the blood. God, I pray that you would open the eyes of their understanding, that you would convict them. Lord, that, you would, that your Holy Spirit would come and illuminate them with the truth that will set them free. That, Lord God, you will draw them into your word, that they will abide in that word until they see, until they understand, until they grasp, until you bring them to a place to a complete surrender, a complete and total uh, 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 repentance and faith in Jesus Christ and what he did on that cross to bring about a justification that results in a transformed life so we can walk in the newness of life. God, I pray that none would perish but all come to repentance, that you would seek and save, Lord, those that, that are blinded to the truth and bring them into the reality of what your word says. Bring them into the reality of a justification that's going to change their life. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. And uh, again, I just want to pray for you if you are sick, if you're dealing with oppression of the enemy in the name of Jesus Christ. I declare right now, every sickness, every disease, I cast you down. I break that stronghold of the enemy in Jesus' name by the blood of a lamb. And I thank you, Lord, that by his stripes we are healed. You forgive all our sins and heal all our diseases. That by his stripes we are healed. We are made whole in Jesus' name. I speak life into your body right now live every tissue, every organ of your body, come into agreement with the Word of God, that by His stripes I declare Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, your healer, over your body, over your mind, in Jesus' name, be made sound and complete in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. 
Again, this is George Dello, Power for Today Prophetic Ministries, coming to you from Toronto, Ohio. Praise God for all of you on here. Glad to see so many friends on here tonight. And uh, 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 bless you. Share this video. The church needs to hear this word. Be on Facebook. Be on YouTube. Uh, they need to listen to last week's as well. And don't, and don't forget, join me next Tuesday. Bring somebody with you. Tell them they need to check out this, this message. They need to hear the truth. Because like Jesus said, there are a whole lot of people on the wide road of destruction. There's a whole lot of people. They say, Lord, 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 we work miracles today. We prophesy. We do wonderful works, Lord. And Jesus says, I don't know you. It's not about works. It's about the redemptive work of Christ. It's about cleaning the inside of the cup. If you got lawlessness, if you got sin inside of you, you're not getting into the kingdom of God. We need to wake up, church. There's a whole lot of people who end up going to hell if they don't hear the truth and respond to the truth and do something with the truth. We need to tell them. We need to get this message out. Share this video and tell somebody to join next Tuesday to hear the rest of this message that's going to bless you and set you free in Jesus' name. God bless every one of you. I thank you for being with me. Keep looking up. Your redemption draws nigh. I'll see you next Tuesday, 7 o'clock. We love you and appreciate you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.